Ah! I can't stop screaming. Sitting upright, drenched in sweat, I grope at my neck where the pain was so real moments ago. I feel for marks, but there is nothing. Shouts come from outside. Terrible screams of anguish. It is no longer dark. The light coming through the window is dim and gray. How long was I sleeping for? My lungs burn. Smoke has made its way inside. That's odd. Grabbing my head, I try to make sense of the events that took place only moments ago. An empty void fills my chest, knowing none of it was real. I could feel her and taste her, but there is nothing now. Only her final words linger before our departure for the second time. When all hope is lost, think of me. I am always thinking of you. The door to the clergy room explodes into splintered wood. Through it, a bogart stumbles over debris and into the chamber. Scouring the room with its yellow eye, sniffing the air, instantly it looks my way. It runs straight for me, growling for, from its frothing mouth. I have no time to react. Half naked, I am left to fend with nothing. The bowaka is on the stand next to the bed, but the bogart is on me before I can reach it. The monster pounces on me and tosses me like a helpless marionette. Its teeth snap at my face and I turn at the last moment, avoiding its corrupting disease. It tries again, attempting to maul my face. Rancid fluids spatter my skin and I gag. With its weight temporarily off balance, I manage to release one of my arms, then the other. My hands find its throat and I squeeze hard, its arms flail in retaliation. It rips sheets and pillows with its claws and soon we are struggling in a mist of feathers. My hands crush its throat and although there is a rush of air, it does not stop. I am covered in wood shavings as its claws rake the headboard like a carpenter whittling wood. The only way to stop it is to pierce the head. The monster now has the upper hand. It pins my arm knocking over the nightstand and as I try to break free, the bowaka disappears from sight. Struggling, we fall off the bed, landing on my back, knocking the wind from my lungs. Gasping for air, the creature rakes my face with its razor claws, tearing away flesh down to the bone. Pain. Absolute pain. My vision dims. The bogart attacks again and I do anything I can to stop it. Blood spewing from my face, I reach for something, anything I can use to protect myself. My hand slips on the wooden nightstand from all the blood. I use the table as a shield. Scrape after scrape, the bogart chips away at the wood. Any second it will give and there will be nothing I can do. I scan the floor for something, but there is nothing. The table breaks, shattering in two, splittering like the door. There is one piece in each of my hands now. Not all is lost. The bogart lashes out and I stake the cursed thing through its one yellow eye, pushing it through the back of its head. Gore spurts onto the wall on the floor. I push the fiend off me, shaking from the pain radiating from my face. Groping around in the morning light, clenching my face with one hand, I find the bowaka blade with the other and pull it close, swearing it will never leave my side again. Staggering to my feet, the situation is dire. Screams continue from outside and I hear glass breaking in the hall. I do my best to ignore the pain, quickly dressing and stra strapping my proofing to my sweat-stained skin. My boots slide on with ease, and I make a quick check on the wood stakes at my belt. Plunging into the hall, I find the way is blocked. Bogarts line the corridor in either direction. Their heads turn at the same time, focusing on me. The odds are impossible. I react instantly, severing a head off the closest one. It collapses the floor, and three more move into to replace it. Scraping, growling, the noises echo throughout the high ceilings of the hall. They fight to get past one another to get me. Each wants their chance to kill me, but I see their flaw in numbers. So many of them hinders their movement in the narrow passage, making my work easier. Maybe I can still escape. Severing another head, I spin around, facing the bogarts approaching behind me. The situation of limited space is the same. Slash and turn, slash and turn. Before long, I am covered with entrails, some stickier than others. I'm not sure how long I can keep this up. 
or I will tire soon. I wonder at the endless supply of bodies. Where are they coming from? Has the whole town turned monstrous? A bogar breaks through my routine and latches onto my blade with its teeth, just missing my wrist. I twist its face, splits, and it splits like a melon. Sweat drips into my eye and stings the wound across my face. Slash, turn! The hallway bursts into flames. I flinch from the suddenness of it. Intense heat flares at my back and causes my face to burn. I try to shield it, but it does nothing. The bogarts are on fire. They screech, burning away in twisting swirls of crimson and orange. The smoke clears and I see Bronin at the end of the hall. No longer dressed in his flowing red and white robes, he is threaded in black shirt and pants taut to his skin. He tosses a flask of holy water, shattering it on the ceiling above him. As the water rains down, it reacts with the Bogart skin, burning the flesh, the flames of God. Bronin mouths something to me, but the noise drowns out everything. His gesture suggests coming to him, so I sprint. Up close, I see his strong, he is strong in physique and agile in foot. The standard robes from before were deceiving. There is no doubt the man can hold his own. What happened? I shout over the noise. He pulls a flask from the satchel around his shoulder. The barrier lamps went out somehow. We need to get out of here. His face is stern, nothing like the night before when he blessed Isabella. What about the organ? You can save the church. Nestor is taking care of that. He pushes me aside, throwing the flask of holy water down the hall. We are wasting time. Screams echo through the corridor as we make way for the exit. We clear the musty interior of the church and are greeted by the gloom of the morning. The courtyard is lost. Scattered fires and rising smoke. Survivors fight for their lives. The undead inhabit every inch of the yard and my hope for escaping dwindles. Descending the stairs, a man is eviscerated before us. Gnashing teeth rip the flesh from his bones, christening me in his blood. Two women, backs to one another, fend for their lives, swinging flaming logs to defend themselves. They are surrounded, and before I say anything, Bronin is headed straight for them. Scanning the courtyard, I search for Kronklik, but he is nowhere to be found. The barrier lamps are certainly out, and for what reason I do not know. Something isn't right. The gate at the wall is demolished. Cave in from assault. Impossible. The Bogars have no understanding of organized attack. Without warning, my shoulders explode with pain and I am sent tumbling down the slippery stairs, landing in a shallow pool of blood. Whose blood is it? I don't know. The metallic liquid drips from my lip and I spit, trying not to vomit. Instinct has me up back on my feet, boots sinking in the mud, hair wet with blood. It stings my eyes and I stare at my attacker. Steadily descending, a caretaker spastically heads my way with a rusted glowing lamp swaying from its hand. I have to avoid it at all costs, for within the lantern resides its soul. It seeks a new host to harbor, a new body to care for. If it goes uncontested, the cycle will repeat, claiming new lives as its stone, rotting away to a skeletal frame once again. No emotion, no sound except for the clicking of its bones on the stone steps. It reaches the muddy ground and continues towards me. I hurl the bawaka, letting it spin wildly. Impact causes the caretaker to explode, dropping its lantern and releasing the trapped howling soul within. As quickly as the blade left my hand, it returns. Two bogarts rush me in unison. One latches onto my chest plate with teeth, the other the bracer on my forearm. I slam them together, cracking their skulls and tossing them aside. A woman falls into my arms, nearly knocking me over, pleading for help. Her face is scratched and patches of her hair are missing. There are so many threads exposed at the neck. Please, my lord, help me. I avoid her eyes while pushing her away and cut off her head with my blade knowing her fate was sealed. Where the hell is Kronklik? 
I look back over my shoulder and see Bronan making quick work of the Bogarts with his holy fire. The two women he went to save lie dead on the ground, pieces of their faces peeled apart and scattered in the dirt. I continue searching for Crockley and find myself frozen to the spot. Nestor is running across the courtyard, swinging his studded mace into the oncoming caretakers. There is something in his arms that I cannot make out at the moment, but realization strikes me when I hear the cry of a baby. It's I move faster than I ever have, slashing away Bogart limbs and scattering caretaker bones. Nestor is unaware of the demons behind him. The Bawaka races forward, shredding everything in its path, cutting down one, two, three Bogarts before it is suddenly lodged in the breastbone of a caretaker. My legs cannot carry me fast enough to Nestor. The Bogarts swarm him from every angle. He's doing everything he can to keep the hellish beast from reaching Manson, forfeiting his own protection. They bite into his arms and legs and back, stripping pieces of muscle and fatty tissue. Instead of crying out in pain, he laments to God, Holy Father, protect your child! Blood runs the length of his body as he is brought down. Manson, bundled in blankets, falls from his hands unnoticed, nearly trampled into the blood-soaked ground. My stake impales the first bogart I reach, piercing its neck, and immediately I retract it for a second strike to the temple. It splinters, yet I use it again for the next bogart, driving it deep into its chest of purplish skin. I know it won't kill it, but it slows nonetheless. Drawing a second stake, I pierce another bogart through its arm just as it reaches Manson, its infectious claw having groped at the blankets. With both hands, I grip the bogart's head and twist harder than before. There is such malice in my heart. I rip its bony head from its neck, ceasing all of its possibilities to function. It slumps to the ground in a dripping heap. Breathing heavily, I know I am reaching my limit, but I can't stop now. Manson is crying frantically, and I scoop him up into my arms. His small nose is streaming mucus, and tears overflow his eyes. Poor child. He has suffered enough already. His dark, watery eyes stare into mine, and for a moment he stops crying. At least one soul will survive this night, I promise myself. The sudden neighing of horses grabs my attention. Cronklick veers off the back end of the church, three horses drawing the carriage. Brandishing his crossbow, he fires while holding the reins. His skill is precise, but he is outnumbered. The Bogarts are fast behind the buggy. Some cling to the carriage, some to the horses' backs. One Bogart tears deeply into one of the horse's neck. The buggy begins to lose its momentum, and this rate, the horses will be eaten. Cradling Manton in one arm, I run toward the carriage, retrieving my Bowaka from the caretaker's rib cage. Manson cries, draws the attention of the courtyard as the Bogarts react and are quick at my heels. I shout at Bronin to come along, but there's no telling if he can hear me. The screams of death drown out everything. I dare not look back. A Bogart's head directly in front of me explodes into fragments and I know Kronklik is watching us. Reaching the horses, Kronklik in a frenzy leaps from his post, drawing his sword from his cane and slashes. His cover provides enough time to cut the bridle and harness from the dying horse. Without the strain of its attachment, the horse staggers a few feet and collapses. The Bogarts swarm, scraping past each other, eager to taste the fresh horse meat. It's now or never. Cronkly, get us out of here! I shout over the whinnying of the horse. With a quick spin and flash of the blade, Cronkly removes two heads and is back on top of the carriage, fending off two more. Softly, I lay Manson on the floor of the buggy, the safest area I can think of to place him. Growling behind me alerts me to a Bogart's claw scratching the surface of my proofing before I sever it. The creature retracts from the carriage, howling. Yah! Yah! I hear Cronklick shouting at the carriage as it lurches forward with a jolt. The buggy gains speed and I stick my head out the side window. There is no sign of Bronin. The smoke has engulfed all of the courtyard. 
Having faith in Crocklick's driving, I retreat back inside, and I hover over Manson like a sentinel, guarding him from any foe that might breach the interior. The carriage shudders twice, then it turns hard to the side. For a moment, I think it will overturn. But, rocking side to side on two wheels, somehow the carriage straightens and there is another thump. A pair of hands suddenly grip this window, and I breathe a sigh of relief. They are old and human. Bronin is at the window, his blue eyes contrast with the sweat and dirt covering his face. He seems out of breath as he scans the interior of the coach, eyes darting to and fro. Where is Nestor, he says in a hopeful tone. I am tired, and all I can do is stare at him. I follow his gaze as he looks at the floor where Manson lies. No words describe the look on his face. Losing Nestor for him was like losing a son. I know the feeling. I help him through the small window as best I can. We both collapse onto the seat, and I can tell he is spent despite his strong physique. Tears run down his face and I turn away out of respect. I look out the window at the fires and smoke plumbing into the sky from Albison Church. The image grows smaller and smaller as the carriage steals into the morning, racing away from the madness and chaos. With no one manning the organ, the church is lost. That is certain. As we pass each street, Bogarts and caretakers emerge from the alleys and cross streets. Monsters seem to be everywhere, walking freely in the dreary light. I look over at Bronin. He is turned on his side, arm extended, fingers touching the small hand reaching out from the blankets on the floor. I watch this touching moment of innocence with reverence, knowing that all my efforts have not been in vain. Leaning down, I do the same. I stroke Manson's smooth head, running my fingers along his brow and grazing his cheek. The little man smiles at me, and my body shudders in memory of Dorian when he was a babe, clinging to his mother's breast, smaller than the width of her shoulders. Thinking my son might be dead, dread fills me. No, I mustn't think of it. I need to think positively. I will do anything to keep this boy alive. I swear it to myself. I must, if I am to keep my sanity. <laughs>